yes, yes, yes. Yep. All right, so before we do the raffle, very short presentation from Don Elman to talk about Commander Magazine. Yay! Huzzah! Huzzah! Well, hello, everybody. Um, I know some of you are have been Commodore fans for quite a long time, as I have. Um, according to this spec sheet, that this reminded me that the Commodore VIC-20, the first affordable Commodore for home use, came out in 1980. Uh, I'll tell you just briefly about my experience with it and how, and back in those days, um, that was, remember, that was before the internet, before people could look anything up on Google, and when people got printed magazines at home and looked forward to it every month or so, and many of those magazines starting in around that period of time for people that were not necessarily computer professionals were aimed at people who were just home computer users. Now, I, my, my profession at that time, I was a college professor teaching psychology in a, in a, in a university in Ohio, and I was getting a little bit bored with, with just psychology and getting interested in computers and I had a couple of small children back in 1980 who were just starting school. And I noticed that some, that their schools were starting to get computers, computers like the Big 20. Now, as a college, young college professor, of course, I had no money at all. Couldn't afford it. Who, who would have thought of buying a computer? But my wife and I decided it was worth investing. As this says, $299 for a VIC-20, because our children were using VIC-20s in their school, and we thought, we need to have something at home. And as a psychologist, I was fascinated by how compelling those little computers were, as small as they were in terms of memory, as slow as they were in terms of, um, as slow as they were in terms of, and, the, and as limited as they were in games, they were fascinating for children and even adults as well. So we bought a VIC-20 back in around 1981, one of the first ones, and we were one of the first people to have a VIC-20 on our block. Now I got really interested in this whole idea of people, especially children and computers, and I decided to change careers a couple years later. Picked up, left my academic job, moved across country from Ohio to, uh, to the Puget Sound area with my wife, and I have been looking around, what can I do with, my, with myself that would be along my interests, but very different. So I discovered there were, uh, that I was looking at some of these computer magazines. Some of you might remember, some of you who are in the older range might remember um, big national Commodore-oriented magazines. Anybody remember the name of one, of one of those magazines back then that was a good national magazine? Oh yeah, Compute. Compute Magazine. That was published out of North Carolina, yes. I believe. Um, actually visited there once. Almost, almost got a job there as, a, as an editor, but they didn't hire me. But I discovered that there was another small magazine that was published out of Tacoma, Washington. And I made some contact with that person. We had letters back and forth. They said, hey, you know, I'm I want to be moving out to that part of the country because I'm leaving my academic job, and I would love to be a computer editor, a computer magazine editor. And he said, well, you know, we don't have any money to, to pay you. And I said, I don't care. I just want to do something that's fun. Well, we finally picked up and moved. I didn't have a job, and I, and I didn't know what kind of office this magazine was um, came out of. But it turns out it was, um, run by a guy named Thomas Rosenbaum, who had started a gaming company. He was a, he had a, he had a group of uh, game developers. Uh, it, may have, it was mainly for Commodore, but I think for Atari and other things as well. And he somehow had this idea, even a year before I arrived, to start this computer user magazine called Commander. Now, I I've, I've brought a couple of examples with me of the ones that have my name on it. My, my term at Commander was very short lived. But he did hire me as, as the editor of this magazine. And it was, his office was this house in a residential area of Tacoma. And the staff was maybe 
four or five people working on the magazine and a bunch of other developers. And it was a very crazy, intense atmosphere. And I kind of got into it. In fact, I got into it so deeply that I was coming home late at night, I was not getting enough sleep, and after a few months, my wife and my, my children had sort of an intervention and said, you gotta do something, you can't, you can't keep this job. So that's why my tenure at Commander was very short. But if you wanna take a look at these, these examples, this magazine was, print, was published for maybe two years. It continued on for a few months after I left. The first magazine that my name is on as, a, as an editor was in December 1983. Figure out how many years ago that was. And you might want to see some of the types of articles. There were programs in here. There were articles about using Commodore computers, lots of ads. Now, um, let me just, I want to finish with um, this presentation. You can ask a question or two with, with one of the editorials that I wrote. This, this issue is labeled March 1984. And there was an article in there about computers were just going into schools. And the headline we put on the cover was, educate your kids with a C64. I don't know what C64 is. So, so I wrote an editorial. Let me just read a couple of sentences from it that I called the last school. It goes like this. Perhaps your children, like mine, have had the opportunity to work with microcomputers at school. But how much hands-on contact do they get? Except for a few particularly affluent and advanced places, a typical American student is probably lucky to receive as much as one or two hours of computer access each month. Ooh, wow. <laughs> today, right? But that's how it was. Now, if the current trend of computer acquisition by schools continues, however, it may not be long, I said in 1984, before computers become the standard medium of education delivery. We will know that time has come when keyboarding replaces penmanship. Yeah. That's happening. As a basic skill. And children carry disc packs instead of book bags. Uh. Not sure if that's happening. <laughs> well, let's get down. One of the most serious questions facing our school is whether computers will eventually eliminate the need for teachers and centralized learning centers. See, I have a vision. Um, in a sense, the present system of one teacher for each 30 or 40 students is extremely inefficient and open to wide variations in quality. Yet there is still value in the, so, in the socialization that takes place in group educational settings. So my best guess, 34 years ago, is that schools will still exist throughout the computer age, but their organization and appearance will evolve to be different from today's structures as today's are from the one-room schoolhouses of the past. Now, you can ask yourself, has that happened? I doubt it. But, Put yourself back 35 years ago. And seeing these, the, especially the VIC-20, the Commodore 64, it brings back such memories of nostalgia. So thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? You can ask now, or, or I'll hang around for a few more minutes. Yes. Uh, Don, um, as the editor of a magazine, did you see the other Commodore magazines as your competitors, and that you had to like uh, be better than them? Well, sure, there was always the, the sense that we want our magazine to keep growing. Now, I learned a lot about the magazine industry back then and realized that what people pay for subscriptions is not really what covers the cost of a magazine. It's what advertisers pay for their advertising space. And they'll pay more if you have a wider circulation. So, so the goal is to get more advertisers and to raise the advertising rates and the only way you can justify that is to get more of a circulation. So word of mouth, advertising. I believe at, at one point, Commander did have a, a national reach, even though it started regionally here. It never was as widespread as Compute Magazine, which I guess was the king of computer magazines back then. Byte. Did it? Byte. Well, and Byte, Byte I think was, wasn't Byte a little more general. That was not a computer, a, a Commodore-focused magazine as much as, you know. There were, of course, several national magazines that were general-oriented toward computer 
um, consumers and as well as to the institute and professionals. All right, thank you very much. Anything else? Thank you. Oh, one other question about that? Well, I'd say of the ones out here, um, the one that's closest to my heart has to be the Vic 20, because that was the first one that we bought. But then we, we quickly graduated to the Commodore 64. I remember tape drives, just like the one out here. Um, and my, uh, and I have two sons, my two sons are now grown, they're in their 40s, and they are also involved in the software industry down in Silicon Valley. So you see, there was some influence of having that, uh, that first big plane. And now my grandson, who's over here, is following in our family tradition. Being interested in technology and computers. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. I want to take a take a look at these. I can't. I don't have enough to give away, but <laughs> just out of curiosity. <laughs> That's true. Z one twenty eight. Time for the wrap. All right. It's raffle time. So, Robert, can you see what we are going to win today? So, by the way, Robert Bernardo is basically the one-man show who puts on Pacific Commodore Expo and brings up about 98% of the artifacts you see today. So, just really quick, I want to thank Robert. So, if everyone can give him a hand, just seriously. You're all the hero. Seriously, you're bringing all this Commodore stuff to us every single year in one car. It's impressive. Very impressive. All right, so let's take a look at what we're going to win today. Power supply. Power supply. I'm just going to repeat what Robert says. Power supply. Disk drive. Disk drive. Ooh, with some free Velcro patches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> there you go. Commodore it makes it way cooler, I promise. Commodore 128. And the Commodore 128. Look with how pretty. Jiffy Dos. With Jiffy Dos. You don't know what Jiffy Dos is. I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Commodore 128 is another very famous member of the Commodore family. You can actually play on it, I think, right there is where you can test it out. Um, so we're just going to draw ones for our one big winner. <laughs> All right, Gravity has decided the winner. So everybody, if you have your ticket, we're going to look at the number at the very top, okay? So it's 0029815. Oh, we have our winner. Awesome. Hello, sir. Yay. And for those of you who didn't win this time, no big deal. You can literally play on the Commodore 128 right there or upstairs on the second floor anytime. Thank you guys so much. Yay! Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Take it away. More room for my car. Yay! Get back here, guys. Do you live local? I live in South Seattle. Oh, okay. And you're quite welcome to drop by the Seattle Retro Computing Society. We meet once a month in Red.